Hello, and welcome to the TIFO Football Podcast. I'm Joe Devine, and here's Alex Stewart. Hello. Uh, how are you, Alex? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? Uh, yeah, I'm delighted uh, because we had such a great episode. Just had a text from Ian Everett, our guest, saying, thanks for having me, really enjoyed it. Yes, I really enjoyed it too. Uh, Ian Everett, manager of Barrow. Barrow, of course, uh, Barrow in Finesse, one of the uh, I said one of the more, I suppose, um, what do they call it, secluded areas of the UK, northwest. Lovely bit of wind up there. Very nice spot. Uh Barrow have been nicknamed by their fans Barrow Salona for the style of football that they play. So naturally, we were decided, uh, to, sorry, delighted to talk to Ian about his um, coaching philosophy, which I, by the sounds of it is very inspired by people like Pep Guardiola, amongst others. Um, and here, Alex, is a little glimpse of uh, some of the data that they have, I think, collected themselves, because Opta don't appear to collect data at their level. Their average percentage of possession for the season is 59. Uh, average number of passes is 507. The highest possession in a game was 81%. They have the best ball recovery time in the league. They play the most passes per match, and they have the highest time of the ball being in play. They are playing football in the National League, and currently they are top with 70 points, I think. Obviously, there's a coronavirus pause, and uh, who knows what's going to happen next, but um, it seems like they're the best team in the National League. Would you agree? Oh, by some distance, yes. I mean, they're really, really good. I, I watched some clips before we recorded this, and they're fun. They're a great team, and it was it was fascinating to get an insight into how you make that happen with all of the constraints and preconceptions that come with National League football. Yeah, from a tactical and from a sort of um, a mental perspective as well. We talked to Ian quite a lot about how you mentally prepare yourself and players for football games. And I don't know, I find that stuff really interesting. Yeah, and of course, the, the mental side of things is going to be or is increasingly important now because, you know, they've had this enormous amount of success and it's all paused and they don't know what's happening. So it was interesting to hear his kind of resolve. You know, you can see how he's the kind of person who can carry a squad through a difficult period like that. Yeah. Well, look, it's won me over and you'll hear me say it several times in the episode, but I think it's special. I think something special is happening up there. So delighted to talk to Ian. Incidentally, if you would like to read more about this, Stuart James wrote um, an incredible uh, in-depth piece um, where he visited Barrow. This was a few months ago now when the football was still happening. He talks to Ian a lot. He talks to some of Ian's assistant coaches and some of the players. He talks to uh, to John Rooney, who's Wayne Rooney's younger brother, who plays for the team. Well, he's a deep-lying midfielder, but he scored 20 goals this season. Incredible. Um, and also he talks to a lot of the supporters. And this is so interesting because you get a, a real vibe of the place too and this is a place where supporters had sort of left the team behind and have since because of the style of football and because of I guess some of the success and the positive feeling around the club have all come back so something something special is happening there um, and we were delighted to talk to Ian about it so you can check that out by visiting theathletic.co.uk forward slash TIFO 90 or just TIFO I think they both work now but TIFO 90 90 get a 90 day free trial and uh, go and read Stuart James's piece it's called Barrow Salona um, anyway that's all from us for now uh, but we will leave you in the uh, the very safe hands of Ian Everett Ian can I ask you firstly um, I've heard your team described as unique within the National League. Uh, why is that, do you think? I think it's due to the, the style and brand we play. I think the National League has um, had a stereotype of, of being a very direct physical division um, where most players are, are picked on, on physicality and not technique. Uh, we've kind of changed that mould, uh, mostly due to due to my beliefs, really, my beliefs of how the game should be played. Obviously, I was very fortunate as a footballer to play at the highest level. Um, I've had some fantastic managers and and really have my own way of doing things. Um, and I was told when I first got the job two years ago, my first job in football, that you can't have success, you can't win the National League playing this way. Um, I'd like to think we've gone a long ways to show that you can have success playing the brand of football that we are doing at the moment. Yeah, it's really interesting. I want to come back to talk about the brand of football, but if we can actually first just talk about you as a player being coached yourself, was there a coach in particular that in inspired you or, or that you learned a lot from, which you've taken now in, into your coaching job yourself? I, I was very fortunate in that I had 
a lot of coaches, but different types. Um, I think the game has changed, especially over the last 20, 25 years. The, the game has changed so much. And initially growing up as, as a youngster at, at Derby County from the age of 10 until 21, 22, um, my first coach was a, a guy called Steve Round, who is now Arsenal's assistant manager. So at, at the time, Steve had just finished playing football. He was still a young player. He'd retired through injury and had gone into coaching. And and he was a, a fantastic coach. You could see pretty early on that he was going to be a special coach. And he's ended up working with England, Manchester United, which is exceptional, as well as, you know, Steve McLaren. Um, but at the forefront of that was Jim Smith, um, who was a, a huge character, old school in, in many ways. Um, it was more, you know, he was a dictator rather than a philosopher, but you, you respected him. Uh, so I earned that respect um, and you, you learn things about how things should be run on a day-to-day -day basis. Moving on, then I then had Roy McFarland, who was a fantastic centre-half, who, who played for England, again, was was brilliant in his position and, and kind of taught me the, def the defensive side of things. And then moving through my career on to Ian Holloway, who was a huge part, not just because of the attacking brand that we played at Blackpool, but really about tapping into players' mentality and, and changing their mindsets of, of being, don't settle for mediocrity, don't settle for mediocre. You always have to aspire to be better. You have to have that self-belief. And that's a huge part of football that I underestimated in my early years. Um, and it, it kind of changed my own mindset as a person and, and changed me how I prepare and how I look at things, how I view things uh, and made me a lot more positive as a person. Uh, and then obviously later on in my years, I, I had Paul Cook, who's had a lot of success at Chesterfield, who was again attacking, attacking manager that you pick one or two things from. But I, I've been very lucky in, in terms of how I, when I first started, the way players were, were treated to how, you know, playing through an age and a transition of, of human beings and footballers, you know, the, the way that young players need to be treated and, and spoken to this day and age is completely different to how it is when I started. Yeah, that's really, that's actually really interesting. I was going to pick up on the point you're making about um, Ian Holloway there and how maybe you disregarded the, the, the sort of mentality aspect of it when you were younger. I expect that's probably quite normal of young players, isn't it? I wonder if there's a, if there's an age you reach 26, 27, when you start to think about not just football, but also life in a slightly different way. And then you see the impact that uh, someone like um, Ian Holloway and that mentality can, can have on younger players. You think like one of the keys to coaching is maybe getting the best out of your young players? I think so. I think you have to. Management that I have learned is, is very simple in terms of it's the same as managing any business. You know, you have to manage people and you have to really quickly understand what gets the best out of that individual character. Then every, every character is different. You know, things, players look at things and, and they, they want different things, whether it's finance, success, trophies, you know, fame, they, they all want different things. And it's understanding what motivates them and then using that to, to get the best out of them. As I said, the mental side of the game is huge. And you're right, 26, 27 is probably the age where you kind of leave the football bubble, which you do start in. You know, as a player, all you care yeah. about is football. That's all you want. You think at that young age, you'll be doing it forever. You get to 26, 27, and then you start to think about that transition of what's going to happen after football. I'm not going to be able to do this forever. What What's going to be my next phase of life and there's a long way to go in life you know you end up if you're lucky finishing football at 35 um there's very few that do that a lot finish before that so you have to think about that really quickly and yeah ian holloway was the first one where i really thought you know this is something that i want to do this is you know I was, i've always been a captain but being a leader and, and a manager that was the first stage really where i thought you know i could do this and i need to tap in not only to the tactical side of things and how I want my team to be and what is brand ever, I call it. Um, it's also about the, the mental side of the game and what, what gets the best out of players. How can I motivate them as best I can? So look, those two things together is interesting because I've read um, that you have been described or, or describe yourself as a modern day coach with old school values. Is that essentially what you're describing there? You know, you have the tactical side of the game, you have brand ever, but at the same time, the old school values, are they knowing how to manage people and, and how to work with human beings 100 percent. now we're coming to an age i think where 
that is a rarity to have both. I think you have outstanding yeah. young coaches, outstanding young coaches that are tactically astute, um, that will really, you know, study that side of the game, you know, stat stat based statistics, get the best out of that, put on amazing training sessions, coaching sessions. But that's fine to be a coach. It's when you really need to to tap into players individually and, and manage them. That's the difference. And you have to have those personable skills. You know, you have to be, you have to have that empathy. You have to have that relationship and bond with players. And it's a fine margin, a fine mixture that not many have. You know, I look at, for instance, the top of the game with, with Klopp, Guardiola, Mourinho. They all seem to have that. Yes, they are tactically brilliant and put on fantastic coaching sessions. But if you look at the way, especially with, with Klopp and Guardiola, the way their players interact with them, they have that special bond and relationship as well. So they're two separate entities. And I was very fortunate to be able to learn both during my football career. One of the things that Ian Holloway achieved at, at Blackpool was to get a team that was never expected to play that style of football to play that style of football. You're doing the same with Barrow. Do you think that actually the reason that more lower league English teams don't play possession-based football, attacking football and attractive football is that the mentality tells them they can't, that it's actually not to do with technical capabilities or tactical capabilities but you need a manager who can instill confidence and, and do the mentality side of things right. And that's why those teams are outliers. It's, it's not because the players aren't good enough. It's because the managers don't have the gumption to go for it and can't bring the players along with it. Yes, I, I agree with that. I think um, the first point is the players, especially in the National League level, are technically very good. It's surprising that the standard of football and how good of actual footballers they are. And that's probably due to the fact that the amount of foreign influx we've had in the game, so the better home-based talent has, has moved down the pyramid, which is only natural. However, uh, yes, completely. Um, it's hard to build that belief in the players, and, and sometimes the most difficult thing is keeping that belief when results aren't going your way. It's a lot easier to, to start with that philosophy um, at the start of seasons, pre-seasons or whatever else. It's when it comes down to not getting results, managers seem to revert to type pretty quickly. Whereas you have to have that unwavered belief in yourself and your team that you can get results playing that way. Um, I say to my players all the time that fear, fear is not a stop sign. You do not fear anything. Fear is just a gateway to push through. And it's once you've done that and you've broken that fear factor, what's out the other side is amazing, you know, and when you start to believe in yourself that much, regardless of results, it's the process of what we're trying to do. And you believe in the process. It's when the, that that's when you'll get the end outcome and, and the winning games. I say all the time that, you know, winning is a habit long before you actually start winning games. You have to act and believe your winners before you start to win football matches. And I think that's what my team have done. But it must have been tempting in your first job in professional football to, listen to what people said about the National League and listen to the the style of play that's deemed to be effective and, and think, you know, actually maybe starting out in my career, is it not better to be pragmatic rather than to hold on to these values? Or did you just go straight into it thinking, even if we completely tank, I want to play this brand of football because that's what I believe in? Yeah, I think uh, I came to an agreement with myself that if I'm going to have a good crack at this, then I'm going to do it my way with no regrets, no excuses. Take excuses and regrets off the table. This is what I believed in as a football player. This is what I believe in as a manager and as a coach. So I did that. Now, the first day of pre-season when I first got the job, we did a simple rondo and players couldn't string three, four, five passes together. And I'm looking at my assistant thinking, well, wow, you know, this is, this is incredible. What are we going to do? Have we made the wrong call here? But no, we stuck to our beliefs. Six weeks later, we scored a goal in, in the National League with, with 24 consecutive passes ending with a, a fantastic finish. So it just shows you that once you instill that belief in the players and have that belief in yourself and, and the style and brand that you want to play and you don't move away from it, you are consistent with what you do in terms of on the training on the training ground and with your behavioural patterns and, and instilling belief into the lads that you can get fantastic results. 
I just want to pick up on the point that you were making about watching other managers and managers having both of those skill sets, the tactician and the, and the motivator. You mentioned Klopp and, and Guardiola. I was also thinking of Julian Nagelsmann, who I think you know said something along the lines of football is 70% social competence, even though he's seen by the wider media as purely one of those young laptop coaches, tacticians. Obviously, he understands the, the importance of, um, of uh, man managing too. But also, Jose Mourinho came to mind. And this is someone who we could have a, an argument probably about whether the tactical side of the game has left Jose behind now. But in his time, particularly with Porto, um, you know, he was he was an exceptional uh, tactician, but also he seemed to have the desire and, and um, the air of all of his players. You know, we, and we, we, were talk- we had a podcast recently, I can't remember who the guest was, but this person was essentially saying one of the reasons they thought Mourinho was so successful at Porto, and when he was younger, particularly with Chelsea, was because he was young. And the gap between his age and the age of the players that he was managing was small enough that they were sharing experiences together and that he could understand them in the way that someone can understand, you know, the desires and wants of, 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 of uh, younger players in, in, in his particular time and age. But also he was old enough still to, to uh, earn their respect in terms of a social hierarchy. It, you're, I think you're 38 years old. I mean, do you think that's true, Ian? Because you're incredibly young to be a football manager. Do you think you have a better understanding of the players' desires? And do you think that they can relate to you more because of your age? Could that be a factor? I think it's a big factor. I completely agree that, again, going back to the playing side of things, because I'd come fresh out of a dressing room, straight into a manager's job, I understood about the dressing room and how it works. And again, the different characters involved, the younger players now are a completely different breed to the more senior ones. You know, they've been brought up a completely different way in the world in general, not just in football. So again, yeah, you, you, you have to relate to them. Football again is, is simple. Like any job, you have to want to work for your employer. You have to want to work for the leader. You have to be willing to push yourself the extra 1%, 5%, 10%, whatever it is. And that comes from having a relationship. You have to have that empathy and relationship. And my players know, they understand that first and foremost, I treat them as human beings. You know, every morning I have a simple sign-in sheet in my office. They come in, they they sign uh, that they're in and, and what time they've gotten in. Not not just to, to know that they're in and they're on time and they're not late. For, for me to have that social contact, to ask them how they've slept, to ask them if there's any problems at home, you have to have that bond and and relationship and show that empathy and that way they build trust and all of a sudden on the football pitch they'll start going that extra mile for you right let's talk about the the sort of tactical and coaching aspects of uh, of brand ever then uh, i've heard that you have some some things you call non-negotiables will you take us through those yeah so my non-negotiables are um, for every dead ball especially goal kicks um, we have to show for the ball so my back my back three or four whatever i play with it's non-negotiable to to show and want the ball from the goal kick. We we don't like kicking the ball long. Um, I just believe it, it turns it into a 50-50, a fight ball. The more we can keep possession and try and draw teams onto us, we're, we're better. We, we have some serious pace in the team. And the more numbers that the opposition commit forward in trying to press us, we can hurt, we can hurt them. So that, that's definitely one that I have. Another main one that we've probably spoke about before is that we we always run in at half time, um, always run in at half time. Now you might find that strange, but body language again is huge in football. Going back to the mental side of the game, and when you know my team's winning or losing, and you see players after forty five minutes of hard work, regardless of conditions, put their chests out and and run in to a changing room again, it just sends that message that we are ready, we are here. Um, again in the tunnel we ask them all to speak and, and shout loudly shoulders back chest out again just to give that message that you know we are here we're here to play and you should be fearful of our confidence and our beliefs it's a huge part of the game that again is underestimated for me do you know what it's funny I was watching um, a documentary last night uh, The Game of Our Lives I think 2002 it's about North Korea in the 1966 World Cup in England I don't know if you guys have seen it it's fascinating um, they they were playing in Middlesbrough and the you know, basic concept of the documentary is that the, the Middlesbrough fans just hugely warmed to the North Koreans and they've had this sort of strange international diplomatic relationship ever since which is quite sweet really um, but there was there was a lot of commentary at the time about the North Koreans who were incredibly fit and 
and they were they were army players too so they didn't seem to have any fear and the one thing that was said about them frequently is just nothing phased them. If they went 3-0 down, they still played this same level of uh, incredible attacking football. I think someone described them as little wind-up mice. where You wind them up and leave them and they would be still running at the same uh, pace and, and showing the same body language you know, at 90 minutes as they are at the first minute, which clearly had an impact on them, the teams uh, that they were, they were playing, which I found really interesting. A- Alex, do you, ha- you have a question as well, don't you? Yeah, so I, I've been watching some of the, the build-up play and it seems to me that you have these really nice patterns that you run particularly from goal kicks um how firstly how did you develop those and and secondly how did you get you know i and i i don't want to be in any way pejorative here but the the stereotypical vision of a of a you know national league center half is not the kind of person who is comfortable playing the ball out using rehearsed patterns dropping into space to provide a third man that kind of thing how have you got players doing this stuff? Yeah, so uh, again, it, it comes down to repetition. Um, just going on to the first part about the, um, the the centre halves and the stereotype of the National League, uh, I have this conversation. The amount of managers that I speak to and, and opposition chairman after games that say, "What a fantastic football team you have," and we'd love to play that way. And all of a sudden, I think, "Well, hang on a moment. Your budget is probably twice mine. You could recruit to any budget." If you want to recruit footballers and, and technical players, then you recruit them. They're still there. They might not have the physical capabilities of the others, but you can you can still recruit to any budget, if you know what I mean. So I re- choose to recruit smaller centre-halves that are more comfortable in possession. Yes, we might be affected from set pieces and from dead balls and, and from crosses into the box, but there's different ways to combat that with, with how high you get your line, etc., against um, opposition set pieces uh, in terms of the way we play in the build up we I've learned that from watching different teams studying different teams but also trial and error um, we we trial and error every day in training and we do it in games as well and we've learned that we, we normally have without giving too much away a two or three routines that will initially always show for the ball and that because I'm saying it's non-negotiable to show for the ball, it doesn't necessarily mean that they have to have it. It's, I always say, play what the game gives you. So if the opposition press really high and they're committing numbers forward, then there's a possibility that they could be 3v3, 2v2 at the back. In that case, I ask my goalkeeper to hit one of my centre forwards and then we'll, we'll, we'll squeeze and attack and get a third man run from there. However, most teams tend not to do that because of how good my strikers are at the level and, and how quick and physical they can be. So they, they tend to drop off, which allows us to build attack, rotate in midfield and then try and draw the opposition out of going into say a, a mid or low block and, and play through them. I, yeah. I've, I, I have noticed that, that it seems quite often, particularly I think it Lewis Hardcastle has a lot of space to turn into and run forwards. Is, is that because the way that you're set up teams, teams in the rest of the league are are genuinely quite fearful of that and so they're sitting off and that allows you to to carry the ball forwards and and have these big gaps that you can then exploit yeah I would say so I think we've earned the respect of the opposition now and and more often than not they are sacrificing possession so they are they're dropping deep into say a low block and it enables us to build comfortably uh, like I said with the midfield rotation our midfield players can carry the ball into space or our outside centre backs or, or wing backs can get the ball and drive into space the problem then you have is there's so many bodies in the final third that how you could create overloads how you create space I mean we we have a uh, a structure in attack where we we always have five on the last line in the final third so five on their defensive line we have two ring in the box for the next wave of attack so if we don't score with the first attack we'll pick up the second ball and we'll have the next wave so it's five two and then we have a structure of three at the back which will keep us safe and secure for any counter attack um, what we've had to do now is is kind of use our outside center halves the wide center halves in the three four one two formation a bit like Sheffield United do, where they have to step right in along, along with the wing back and drive to the edge of the opposition box to create that overload, the 2v1 situations, which might draw somebody out of position to then go into the strikers and, and create and combine and score that way. But that, that's how Chris Wilder and Alan Nil came up with that idea, wasn't it? It was because they were encountering exactly the same problem 
at the level that they were playing at was teams were just sitting deeper and deeper and deeper back. And so they had to find some sort of way of bringing an additional player in. Yeah, and, and that's that's true. Um, initially, you will have success because teams won't be able to deal with what you're doing. But when they, the amount of analysis work that goes on in football nowadays, you, you, they pretty quickly understand what you're doing and then they'll they'll try and combat that. Now, yeah, similar to, to what Chris and Alan have, have discovered, that teams will go into that deep, low block and we're not built to throw balls into the box. We're not built for, for high crosses. We haven't got the physical attributes to stick the ball in the box from wide areas and, and go and score. We have to be intricate and create overloads in a different kind of way. And yes, as you've explained, um, the same as Sheffield United do, we use our wide centre-halves to step in and create overloads. We keep the width both sides to try and isolate people 1v1. Or we'll also use that the Kevin De Bruyne, Man City, you know, that perfect goal where it's not a cross, it's that they feed the ball into that corridor of uncertainty between defenders and, and goalkeepers. And we have willing runners that are making constant runs on that back line to stretch them into that area that we've scored a hell of a lot of goals from this season, um, the same as Man City do on a regular basis. You mentioned um, recruitment. I want to come back to that. But first, can I ask you, I've also heard you talking about um, Pep Guardiola's six-second rule. Can you just explain what that is to us? Yeah, so it's just basically a transition regain rule. Um, One thing that's been really difficult with my team and that we've improved on no end, but there's still so much improvement to come, is the reaction to giving the ball away. If you watch the top teams, I mean, Barcelona two, three years ago, Man City, all of Pep's teams really... There isn't a, a disappointment in giving the ball away. It's a, the initial reaction of go and hunt and press it back. And he gives them six seconds to regain the ball back from opposition on transition. So as soon as they give the ball away, there's no disappointment. They don't show disappointment with body language. They go and hunt and press in packs. And to get players and footballers in general to to forget that disappointment of giving the ball away and to hide that body language is really difficult. We've had to work so hard on that, but now we do it quite naturally and that we give the ball away. The initial reaction is front foot, go and press and that we have six seconds to win the ball back. If we don't win it back in those six seconds and the opposition, which they can do at times with good play, uh, break that initial first press, then we have a structure to regain to and, and, and restart the press on on some sort of, of signal, whether it's a bad pass or a bad touch or whatever else. Uh, but that initial six seconds, the amount of times you win the ball back high up the pitch is amazing. And then you'll find that the opposition are out of, straight, out of shape, out of structure, and you can you can play through them pretty quickly. Right, yeah. Hey, and on, on the recruitment, you mentioned it before, and you were talking <clears throat> about other chairmen saying they wish they had a team like you. Um, I know when you arrived at the club, you had to recruit basically a whole team. You didn't really have any players left. What's your approach to recruitment? And also within that, you know, given that you like to play this specific style of football, can you teach what you do to any footballer or do they need to be predisposed? You know, do you like, do you need to, when you're recruiting, do you need to look for, for players that have particular talents? And, and if so, w- what are they? Um, so the initial, the initial recruitment, when I first got the job, um, I think we had three or four players and it was the start of July. Um, and I had to recruit a whole team pretty much off, off everyone else's seconds, you know, by that time people have done their recruitment. So we were quite fortunate in terms of, we didn't probably show the due care and attention we do now in terms of recruitment, but we looked at how we want to play, what we want to do and are these players technical enough to be able to do it. Now I do believe that you can improve any player with coaching and, and the mental beliefs. I think you can improve anybody. But I do also understand that you have to have some sort of, of technical aspect to be able to retain possession the way we do. So we did that. We recruited um, 15, 16 players. Um, some we got very lucky with, some not so lucky. But again, that's that's recruitment. You know, uh, That first season, the club were ecstatic with a 10th place finish. I wasn't. I was probably the only person in Barrow that wasn't, um, <laughs> but it comes down to that mediocrity again. You know, I can't stand for mediocre. It, it just eats, it eats away at me. And I knew it was a missed opportunity because we got better as the season went on. 
I was learning as well. I'm a young manager. I, I'm learning all the time. I'm reading. I'm, I'm trying to improve and take on knowledge and information to make myself better. And I did that throughout the season. But now for this next season, I knew in March what I needed to recruit, who I needed to recruit and how I needed to do it. And that was basically, we had our recruitment done by May. We ended up signing Scott Quigley, who's got 20 odd goals, the, the league's top scorer. And then we went down the route of recruiting position-specific position footballers with a blueprint of what I need for certain positions and how I need them to be, whether that's physically, technically, whatever. We have a bit like, not so much money ball, because we haven't got the access to stats like many other teams do higher up the pyramid, say your Brentfords, etc. But I have a sheet of position specifics that I need whether it's out of possession, in possession, physical, mental, all of those things. And it's basically just a selection, a box tick to how many of these players that are up for grabs, you know, how many boxes do they tick and will they fit into this system and do the things I need them to do, which is quite in depth for, for non-league football or lower league football. But I think it's worked this season. What what kind of um, stuff do you read in terms of, of improvement? And also, are you are you watching you know, on the the video scouting platforms, are you constantly on those looking for, for people as well? Are you, because obviously metrics, they're quite hard to get hold of and, and you're probably shopping mostly around your level or, or the players that are slightly above, but maybe not working out at that team because they suit your style, but they don't suit the other teams. How, how do you find that? Because it's quite hard when you don't have the data. Yes, it is hard. Um, obviously, the good thing for me is that because I had such a long career and I, I pretty much played at every level, uh, I built up a big network of people and friends and I can bounce things off them and I can get certain information that probably some shouldn't. Now, again, going back to position-specific stuff, um, we have a GPS data guideline now that we've we've kind of got from Man City but interpreted it into our own system and our, our own level of football so the players have position specific goals to reach on, on a daily basis but definitely in matches you know how much high speed running they should do um, what distance should they be covering if the if the team covers X amount of distance then it gives us a 90% chance of winning the football match that kind of thing we've developed as well Um which again is something that's used high up the pyramid and I've been able to tap into to use that. So there's, there's lots of things you can do. Recruitment wise, yeah, you, you, it's literally you get out of it what you put in. It's like anything in life and you have to be out watching games. You have to be at home watching games. Management, is if you want to be a success, is, is 24 hours a day, seven days a week. My wife will tell you that. I'm constantly looking at players. I'm constantly watching other teams. Um, when you're playing against opposition, you, you get to see what the good players or players that you think will fit into your system are like and can you recruit them? Are they available for, for you and your budget? That That's a huge thing. And in terms of improving myself, this... This has been a huge opportunity, this lockdown for me. I don't really get this much amount of time at home, time to myself where I can sit and think. And I'm using this opportunity to, to make myself better. How, how can I improve myself? What can I do to improve? So I've read three books on, on leadership and mentality. One called The Score Takes Care of Itself by Bill Walsh, a famous NFL coach. I'm massively into to NFL and, and different coaching ways and how they engage with their players. Uh, that's about leadership and mentality and about having a, a commitment to excellence, a standard of performance that he calls it. So I'm in the process of, of making a document which will be used from everybody at the football club, from people that answer the phones to, to the players, to the coaching staff about how we carry ourselves, how we provide excellence, how we stand for excellence. Um, that's the thing that he did that really worked and I've really bought into that. So I'm doing that. I also read a book called uh, The Boat, what um, will it make the boat go faster? Which is about an Olympic team in the year two thousand, very much in Steve Redgrave's shadow. Um, they weren't fancy to win gold, but they ended up win, winning gold medals. And the process of getting themselves to that, the beliefs and mentality to do that. Again, it's just a question that you've got to ask the players. You know, whatever you're doing in training, or what, whenever you're away from training, 
and again football is 24 hours a day seven days a week if you your wife's at home eating a pack of biscuits next year it's a decision are you making the right decision that's going to make us win on a saturday it's that simple and it's that in depth and that's what you need to think about to get the best out of yourself so that's another one and then i've read a i actually worked with this guy called bill bezik who's a sports psychologist who's worked with a, a lot of top professional football teams and other sports um and he's just done a book on, on leadership and mentality as well. So so that's the kind of route I'm doing um, in terms of improving myself. Also, obviously, I'm watching Man City. I'm watching Sheffield United. I'm watching Liverpool. I'm watching our games from this season and, and opposition games on, on what I think we need to improve and, and how we need to do it. You can always set yourself goals, but you need to, amongst that big, end goal you need to have a process of how to get there and set yourself small achievable goals to get yourself to that end game and that end target my end goal is to be a premier league manager but how am i going to get there i have to set a journey out in place to get myself to that level of knowledge and that level of information and that level of management so i'm going down that process at the moment i was just i was going to ask you about that later what your what your ambitions are and I don't say this, uh, you know, to suck up or anything, Ian, but reading about your story, reading about your team, listening to you talk about them and about how you're filling your time on the lockdown, it's, it does, it strikes me that something special is happening uh, in Barrow and Finesse. You know, like it, it seems that there's this kind of weird, and this happens sometimes, and to step away from football for a moment, like sometimes you have uh, periods in people's life, like songwriters, for example, who feel, whose songs for a period of time are just, unbelievable to the point where you can't understand how someone wrote them and you feel like they're chained into the universe. Do you, you know, when you're going to sleep at night and thinking about what's happening in your life and what an incredible job you're doing, do you ever feel like you're chained into the universe? If you know what I mean? Yeah. Going into a bit deeper. Um, again, at about three, four, no, maybe longer, five, six years ago, I read a book called the secret, which I'm not sure if any of you know about this book, but it's about the power of, thinking and the power of the mind and the power of the universe and how your thoughts control actions you know and every day i'm reinforcing myself with positive thoughts you know i have a vision board at home about my visions and what i want and how i want to achieve them and yeah going back to barrow the the biggest thing that i can take pride of yes we we play great football and we've had success and the media is starting to take note of, of what we're doing but the most amount of pride I take is seeing how it's changed the community. Um, when I first went to Barrow, you know, it, it's in, it's really isolated in terms of geography where it is in the country. Um, it's very much a glass half full kind of place. It's, it can be quite intense. It, it, it can be, it can be difficult, you know, and, and everyone sent and happy when I first went, there was no connection with the football team. They'd lost that connection. They were voted out of the Football League 48 years ago. That left a bitter taste. Um, we'd lost a generation of support. And they were used to seeing direct physical football. They'd never seen anything like we I was trying to do. So to re-educate not only the players, but the board of directors, the, the chairman, and the rest of the fans and the community in general was, was a difficult task. But I must say they bought into it. They enjoy it. And now the whole community is a different place. The connection that the team, the club has with, with the wider community in Barrow again is, is really special. Everyone wants to talk about football. There's fans wearing Barrow shirts again, young kids wearing Barrow shirts and not Man United and Liverpool shirts. The lost generation of fans has returned. And that's really special. And that's something that makes me immensely proud that I think about on a daily basis. Also, like on an even more intimate um, level, I think, you know, there's there's that aspect with the community, but with the players, they must adore you, right? I mean, you must like, or, or at the very least, that you've made, you will have made a significant impact on on their lives. And and you know, you group of a group of guys in the dressing room before and after games, like presumably you have a very special connection now as a result of of everything that's happened over the last year or so. Do you do you feel that? Is it palpable? And 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 I guess presumably that makes you proud as well. Yeah, I think we do have a great relationship and that's every single one of them. Um, I think they understand that first and foremost, I treat them all the same and, and I treat them all as human beings. That's really important. You know, the, the most important part of football is not the 11 on the pitch. They take care of themselves. It's the other 20%. 
the ones that are out the team, how would you keep them on board? How would you keep them pushing the other players in the right direction? How do you keep them engaged? And they all know that regardless of who's playing on a Saturday, they all get the same coaching, they all get the same level of information, but they all get the same treatment. Whether they have any problem outside of football, and we you know, players do have problems like anybody else, they have financial difficulties, they have marriage breakups. And if they understand that, first and foremost, that's the most important thing, their mental health and how they're treated, then the football will come secondary to that. But also the football will take care of itself because you've showed them that level of empathy and that level of respect. Yeah, and we that's have, fascinating. We have that bond and relationship and they know that I not only gave them a pledge that I'd improve them as players, but I also said I'd improve them as humans. And I think we've shown that we're growing as, as a unit and as a team with the stuff we do off the pitch in the community, but also the, the, the skill and technical capabilities that we're playing with on the pitch. So your your um, personal ambition then is to become a Premier League manager, is that right? Of course, of course. You have to, in my mind anyway, you have to aspire to be the best at whatever you're doing. If you don't, then there's no point doing it. It comes down to that mediocrity and, and being happy with mediocre. I can't, I can't live with myself. And maybe that's the sportsman in me, the competitive edge, the footballer in me coming back out that I want to win and I want to win on a consistent basis, but I want to be the best at what I do. And I have that drive and that hunger to do that. And, you know, this this does probably sound arrogant to some people, but I know I will one day. I know that my journey is set out to be a Premier League manager and I will be a Premier League manager one day because there'll be no stone unturned to do that. And I say that to the players, self-analysis is, is vital in everything you do. Look yourself in the mirror and say, have I done enough? Am I doing enough? Have I took all excuses off the table? And that's what I'm doing as a manager. Excuses are being taken off the table and I believe that that will get me to the top. Yeah, and I don't think it sounds arrogant either. I, I think it's I think it's self confidence, and there's um there's a real difference there. And I, I can completely understand and empathise that that having those sorts of thoughts and feelings is is very important for someone who's who's striving for the for the top level of something. I mean, presumably people you know people within the game have taken notice, right, Ian? Do you, I mean, if you that that that's happened, yeah. Yeah, obviously this this season, especially with success on the pitch, I mean, it's, it started last season because we were starting to build that brand and, and that identity and people were were seeing it this season because of results and because of everything else that's happened. It, it's a lot more in the spotlight and the limelight and then people from higher up the leagues are, are now starting to understand what we do. You know, we get... I had a message the other day off um, my youth team manager who's part of a, a big scouting network um, where there's... there's head of head of recruitments from all over the world in this in this one group and they were talking about who's playing the best football in in England in, in Europe and, and we've been mentioned about what we're doing at the level we're doing it at is is incredible and that makes me so proud to even be mentioned with these big European clubs um it's great, you know, and it just shows you that we're on the right path and the right journey. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well, listen, can I ask you about a, a particular player, um, John Rooney, who I think if I'm right in saying, I mean, I pulled these stats offline, so they might be wrong, but as far as I'm aware, he scored 17 goals in 37 games, but as a deep-lying midfielder. Is that right? Yes. Um, he's actually scored How? 20 in all competitions. <laughs> 20? <laughs> yeah. Um, John, John is technically so gifted, obviously, and, and he hates it and I hate it. And he's a very, very independent, self-driven person. He doesn't like speaking about his brother. Um, he's always compared to his brother. And I don't think that's fair because John is a fantastic football player in his own right. When he first came to me last season, he'd moved around a lot. He'd been in America. He would played in New York. He would played for loads of non-league teams, some in league two, and he'd never really found a home. Now, a, I think that's because he's technically so gifted that he doesn't do the ugly side of the game well enough um, for most, as we're going back to how the stereotype of lower league football and national league football is, he yeah. doesn't do the other side of the game well enough for that. And he needed someone to just believe in him, really, just give him that self-belief and confidence to, yes, you have a defensive responsibility, but that isn't your primary 
You know, I don't want you to concentrate on that. I need you to concentrate. I always say, again, it's another saying and phrase of mine, play to your strengths, hide your deficiencies. And that's football. That's football. So the more that you have the ball, John, and the more that you're making great passes, rotating with midfield players, uh, taking dead balls, shooting from the edge of the box, the less defending you're going to have to do. And he's really embraced that and took that on board. And he, he knows that I have such belief in him. And he tries things that most players shouldn't and won't. But again, it's that fear stop sign thing that I spoke about earlier. That that isn't, you know, the fear of it going wrong, especially in the right areas of the pitch that we define. You're free to try things. You're free to experiment. You have to play with that freedom, that rotation, providing someone's there to take your place. I don't mind you going up front for for 10 minutes, providing my centre forward drops back in and and keeps the structure of the team the same. You have to have that freedom. That's what makes us hard to play against. And he's done that. He's bought into it. And he's just been incredible this season. And if I showed you some of his goals or if you've seen some of his goals, they belong at the highest level. John's, John's technique is fantastic. Yeah, in terms of goals, obviously uh, he uh, has has scored a lot, but Scott Quigley has scored even more. Um, Quigley's a he's a big striker, right? You know, he's he's physically tall. He looks very broad, but you've got him. Yes, occasionally he's an out ball, which is which is helpful. But you've got him playing in quite a different kind of way. So, I was curious: a how you find a player who is able to score that many goals, and but but isn't getting a game elsewhere, and also how do you how do you kind of reconstruct a player's style to to be quick, play along the ground, have these really nice little interpasses with the the other striker and the attacking midfielders coming forwards when at six foot four he's kind of probably got the expectation that you're gonna to want to just lump the ball up to him and he'll win it in the air and then go from there. Yeah. So again, um people fall into that trap. Now last season we we lacked goals. Um, we were dominated possession, dominating games and, and weren't scoring enough goals. So going back to what I said earlier, I realised in March what we needed. In the National League, you need someone who can cope with the physicality of defenders. So someone that's that's big, strong, physical. But in my team, you have to be mobile, number one. And number two, you have to be technically good enough to be able to play with your feet, link attacks and build, build attacks. We looked at hours and hours and hours of videotape on, on so many players and we identified Scott pretty quickly in terms that he's a rarity that people look at his size and his strength and think this guy just must be a physically you know, stereotypical number nine from, from lower league football. No, Scott is quick. He's technical. He's never really had much of a goal record, but... I was willing to sacrifice that for everything else that he gave us. So we offered him a three-year contract, which for Barrow, I mean, I must give credit to the chairman, which is unheard of. Um, To get that length of contract in lower leagues is is difficult, but we had to do that to make sure we got him for, for within our budget and give him that security. And he chose that, but he bought into what I was telling him. He'd seen how we play football. He wanted not to be that stereotypical number nine, but to be able to link play and move and be technical. Um, And when I met him, I always meet the players before I sign them to get a feel for the personalities. I said to him, what would be your goal target this season? He told me 15. I said, that's not good enough. That's not good enough. That's mediocre. I'm, I'm thinking 30. You will score 30 in my team. And he bought into that. He took that on board. Now, he didn't get 30, but he was well on his way to getting 30. And again, he's he's bought into what we do. He's learning all the time. He's not come from a traditional football background. He wasn't bought up through an academy. He was playing you know, non-league, semi-professional football in Wales um, before going into the professional game. And he's still improving at 26, 27. There's, there's stuff that he's never learned before that we're teaching at the moment and he's getting better and better and better and there's still so much more to come. Well, listen, I mean, I suppose the last thing to say is that, you know, your team are top of the National League. Obviously, there's a pause at the moment. We're uncertain how football is going to resolve itself. Um, it's worth bearing in mind, I suppose, that, that uh, Berry's expulsion means there is a spot um, in, in League Two. So it's possible that your case might be treated differently if there, if promotion was um, ruled out. But at the moment, you're just waiting to find out. Um, how difficult is that, Ian? 
yeah, it's difficult. It's the unknown, really. It's the unknown of A, when football's going to be back again, but B, what division we're going to be in. Now, we never asked for the league to stop. We never asked for this. We we had firm belief that we would have finished the season on the pitch. And that's what's really difficult to deal with is, you know yourselves, winning things in football and winning championships and titles, it doesn't come around very often. It's really difficult to do. And then moments of, of seeing full houses at Barrow, um, embracing the whole atmosphere with the supporters, you know, lifting trophies together as a group, spending time together off the pitch as a group, whether it's going away on a, on a short break, celebrating what we've, we've missed out on all that. And regardless of, of what happens next, this season is always going to have an asterisk next to it where we, we knew we were the best team. We had firm belief that we'd get the job done. And that's kind of been taken away from us from no fault of our own. Now the challenge is whatever's next, and I've said this to the players and I'm, I'm taking this on myself with, with the information I've given you already. We have to be better. We have to be better again. If we stay in the National League, we have to be better again and prove to everyone that we're the best team and go and win that again. But if we go into League Two, we're not going up there to make the numbers up. We're going up to compete and we're going up to, to win promotion from that division as well. So whatever you're doing right now, you should be improving your game or improving your psych and your mentality, ready to go again, ready for when we have that next challenge. And does the pause also, uh, you know, cause a sort of pause uh, in or stopping in the momentum of the team, not just on the pitch in terms of results, but also, you know, from so much of what you described, it sounds like it's a, it's a group that's very together, that's improving all the time, that's getting to know each other better all the time and, and strengthening those connections. Presumably the lockdown um, and the isolation of the players from one another and from you, does that feel a little bit like it's sort of um, stunting your efforts there as well, that there might be more work to do when they come back to try and, you know, G everybody back up again into the same feeling that there was pre-lockdown? Um, fortunately, with, with the way the world is and the technology, that they're able to, to connect with each other still. They, they talk on a daily basis. The players are, are so competitive that they're having running competitions with each other who can run the fastest 5K, 10K, for instance. <laughs> nice. and, and that's how competitive they are. You know, they want to win at everything they're doing. So that's not that's not so bad. It's more, I mean, one of our plus points is how fit we are as a team. And we've worked so hard on the strength and conditioning side of things to, to play the way we play and the way Liverpool and, and Man City play, etc. You have to be really, really fit. So we do a hell of a lot of work in the gym. Now, our players, unfortunately, haven't got gyms at home like some of the Premier League players. So we might have lost some s &C, you know, some strength and conditioning that we've had to work for two years. Yeah. On. So we're going to need time to rebuild that again, um, which is frustrating because we, we that really set us apart from the rest as well, the, uh, our strength and conditioning, our fitness side of things. That's the one thing I think that we're going to have lost that we're going to have to rebuild uh, which is challenging, but we'll, we'll no doubt do it. Well, listen, you know, whatever happens and whatever the outcome of the season is, um, a massive congratulations for, for all the efforts up to, up to this point. I think, as I said before, Barrow and yourself appear to be doing something really special. Um, it's fascinating from our perspective. And, um, you know, Alex and I are delighted that you, uh, that you agreed to come on the podcast. So thank you. No, thanks very much, guys. And I hope you've, you've enjoyed it. First and foremost, I have. Um, I'm very passionate about the game and I love talking about football. So, um, yeah, it's great. it's great to be on. So thanks for having me. Will you promise to come back when you're a Premier League manager? Of course, of oh, course, God. no problem. <laughs> You'll be our first. That's fantastic. I'll hold you to that, Ian. I will. All right, fantastic. Thanks so much. And uh, we will be back next week with uh, something else. Mm -hmm.